Yes, and thanks for all the fabulous questions. Um, I do need to get to um, the point landing, though, so Helmut can take off next week. So I would ask that if you have questions that are technical, technical, or academic, academic, you ask me after the talk. So, which means... So ask me, and what you should ask me about is how in the world do I apply this to my favorite J-curve space? You know, that's what we're really here for, right? So, the why don't you just, <laughs> or is this algebraic geometry questions are good for <laughs> coffee. <laughs> good, all right. So, here's our theorem and today the goal is to actually explain every single word. So. We want to regularize a moduli space, which we think of as being cut out as the compact zero set of some section. Um, we know by now what an M polyfold is. We know essentially what scale smooth is. I'm going to need to tell you what Fredholm is. We know what a section is. Um, right. So the reason we want to model every thing on scale Hibbert spaces is that we want cutoff functions. So, um, that's why Hilbert and not Banach. Huh? Hilbert and not Banach. Right, exactly. I mean, but you can do it also in certain Banach spaces. Right, but we don't want to worry about that right now. Um, so then, really the key is that something is non-empty. And what is that? So it's a space of other sections that are SC plus in some sense, which I'm going to need to. So if you're seeing SC plus, what you should think is compact perturbation that are transverse general position to boundary, if there is boundary. Um, and I'm going to be allowing myself to fix a neighborhood of the zero set and a norm. Um, and I'm allowing myself to force the section, the perturbation to only happen in that neighborhood and to be bounded by that norm. Since I can scale, I'm going to be able to scale that norm down so I can have a one here. So this pretty much means I can make my perturbations as small as I want. And that is the reason that I think you... Now with these two writers, I think you don't need any kind of genericity or comega. You know, this gets you to make your perturbed zero set as close to the unperturbed as you want. Um, there is also the Obamacare um, writer. So if you like your solutions, you can keep your solutions. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so what I need to explain at some point is also what an auxiliary norm is, what Fred Holm is. Um, what else, SC plus, this is right. So what do I mean by controlling compactness? So, <laughs> right, if you just add a perturbation in this infinite dimensional setting, it's totally not clear that the perturbed zero set, right, which we're gonna want here, um, I mean, it's gonna be smooth if it's cut out transversely, but why is it compact? And so we're just going to build this into the definition and then somebody has to you know, prove that there are norms and neighborhoods that control compactness. So controlling compactness means that if I have any SC plus section that satisfies these two things, not necessarily transversality, then this set, however irregular it is, is compact. All right. So check. We know that. Good. What's Y prime? What's what? Y prime. Y prime. Oh, right. Y, good. Yes. Y1 is sort of the quality one fibers, and I should say that again at some point. That's going to happen. Um, so, right. So, now the implicit function theorem that Joel already told us about gives us, you know, cuts out nice smooth manifolds. Um, and since I'm asking for general position, actually, I know exactly what my boundary and corner strata are. That's important if you sort of do Fleur theory or something, right? You do a one-dimensional moduli space, um, you regularize it, and then you're going to get, you know, that 
the sum over the boundary terms is zero because it's a one manifold. Now you'd like to know that those are actually the once broken trajectories and not the triply broken trajectories or something. Right? So the actual boundary would be degeneracy one in my perturbed Fleur space and this regularization theorem says that that's actually exactly where my perturbed zero set hits the degenerate index one locus in my ambient space and in Fleur spaces, degeneracy exactly comes from number of breakings. So that's the only boundary you get. Right. So this is actually has applications. Right. Um, right, so you might ask, why in the world did we talk about good enough? So the good position is something that happens when you're trying to force more coherence of your perturbations. You might not be able to make general position um, but that's because you've already <laughs> prescribed the section on boundaries, which is something I haven't done here. Right. So that's where good position comes from. Let's see. What else do I need to say? Right. So in order to regularize now, I should say that somehow whatever count I get here is invariant under choices. And so I need to particular, well, I really I need to think about what happens when I vary j or whatever um, in my um, setup. But mainly in this theorem, I need to think what, it, what happens if I take two different perturbations. Um, and the claim, well, certainly most of, these per, most of these conditions, except for transversality, sort of a convex set. So I can make a one parameter family, and then I wiggle that one parameter family again a little bit to get transversality. So, right, so I take a PT that goes from P0 to P1, and I built this into a, a Fredholm section over 0, 1 times x. So the neat thing is this is all now Fredholm, so I don't really have to sort of go and prove again that this is Fredholm. What I'm doing here is I'm adding one dimension in the domain that should you know, add one to my Fredholm index. And then I'm adding a smooth section that's also compact. So that shouldn't, you know, by so sort of, there should be Fredholm stability, so this shouldn't change my Fredholm index at all. And so, you know, all those sort of basic Fredholm facts I think, survived in polyfolds. So, this is gonna be polyfold Fredholm, it's gonna be transverse after I wiggle enough by using that theorem again. And then I get a smooth, Kubotism out, um, which goes exactly, well, the only, if there was no boundary before, then the only boundary I have here comes from the interval. And so then it's a Kubotism from whatever happens at zero and whatever happens at one. <laughs> so, all right. I wanted to write a box, except somehow statements of theorems nowadays are harder than proving theorems. Good, yes. Did you say that PT has gotten just by like linearly going through? Well, and then you have to wiggle a little to get transversality. Right. Yeah. Good. So, any questions about the statement? Any non academic questions? Good. Um, so, um, right, I want to. Well, I should say what a strong, tame M polyfold bundle it actually is, and in particular, I need to fix notations. So I can actually tell you what a Fredholm section is. Um, but I'm going to just tell you about this special case that so far has sufficed in all um, in all applications. So I'm going to say, um, and the nice thing is that. This special case will be things that are automatically strong and tame. So I want to not just talk about general phrase tractions, I'm just going to talk about splicings. So an M polyfold bundle of splicing type is what? Right, so I start with a, something that should be a bundle. So I need some kind of surjection. between two 
polyfolds um, that are well that are modeled on on splicings, which you may not really know yet, but it's going to become evident once I write down the local trivializations. So together with So I'd like this to be a vector bundle, so I'd better put a real vector bundle structure on each fiber vector space structure. So that's going to be, oh goodness. Right, y sub x, you put a superscript t here. Um, if you were wondering, right, these if you perturb, you might have to actually go into a different. No, this is, that's totally a lie. Bundle doesn't change when I change my perturbations. Sorry. It just does if I change J. Right. OK, good. So these are actual fibers here. Right. And I need local trivializations. Right, so you see the exercise in writing the polyfold book is to really take your differential geometry book and just sort of write SC or polyfold in front of everything. Right. So. Except at things which use the opposite functions. Right. Maybe. Yeah, at some point you have to worry a little. Can we call them spirals? <laughs> So, right, so there are splicings that are just sort of the m polyfold models, and now for a bundle, I want a bundle splicing. So what is that? Um, well, it happens over an open set in the base. Um, I would like the local bundle to be SC diffeomorphic. linear on fibers to a certain model R, which is, again, a retract, but it's a specific retract. So um, I'm going to, at some point, probably forget to specify open subsets of retracts or splicing. So if I do that, you can fill them in, or you can just ignore this. So. Um, So whatever this retract is, it's going to have a very nice structure. So there's going to be one parameter that parameterizes families of projections, which give you the base and the fiber. So this whole thing, so my, my parameter is allowed to, that's where all the boundary comes from. So this is where v is some finite dimensional parameter, and that's where all the boundary comes from. Um, and then I have a family of projections on a scale Hilbert space E and one on a scale Hilbert space F. So um, these two are so lin in particular linear projections. which means also I don't have to worry about scale smoothness of them by themselves. I just have to worry about scale smoothness with respect to that parameter. These are usually the gluing parameters. Right. So, um, right. And now I'd only have to write this once because you don't know whether this is a small pi or a large pi. Right. So, um, but there are two different families here. Um, and on this, Right, and this is, well, this would be the retraction, actually, let me write the retraction here. Um, drag and drop. So the parameter space of V is here. Um, so then the retraction just goes to V, projection on E, capital pi projection on F. 
Um, this is not algebraic geometry. No, All sorry. Right. <laughs> Good. No, so I just wanted to know, um, you know, you, the way you've set, up, set this up, first you take the projection, and then you build a bundle out of things you projected, and then yes. you get a section. Why do you do that instead of uh, taking an honest SC infinity vector bundle or whatever, then taking a section, and then taking the projection at the end? What's the... Because that's what you have, really. If you think about it, well, ask me that again once I've given you the real example, okay. I think. That's, um, or even the toy example. So, um. so you're saying it's an SC splicing because these projections are linear. Right, right. yeah. It, so the nice thing is, right, so, so the, all the weirdness now comes from jumps in dimension of the fibers, right, of these images of the projections. So, right, yes. So the thing is that what I'm asking to be scale smooth is this map. I'm not asking pi v as an operator to depend continuously on v. Well, hmm? it, will not. it will not, in fact. Well, it might, but then everything is boring. So if it, if it varies continuously with v, then, sorry, if the operator topology is continuous, then the dimension of the fibers doesn't change. Um, but in infinite dimensions, you can let the dimension of the fibers change. That was exactly the example that Nate worked out yesterday. Um, and so you have this sort of bundle with varying dimensions of fibers. And, and really what happens is, see, these retracts, that is your space. Right? That's where you have the sections. It's just like Kuranishi structures. The, the sections happen over the sort of small little things, and you don't have a canonical extension to anything bigger. So the, the bigger stuff here, um, the sort of ambient spaces just exist locally, and nobody says that they fit together in a nice way. So I don't usually have an extension of the section to the bigger stuff. This is not like what, what I'm talking about here, S is not just a restriction of some section in a Banach bundle to some weird subspace. Right? So the local sort of Banach ambient spaces are just local. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. All right. So, um, yeah. Ah, yes, I should, uh, okay. Did I say, I did, did not even say this. So, right, so this is, the, this is the base. And this is the fiber. So, um, really, right, so what I should say, such that fibers go to images in, in F. So really, right, so this is the base, that's where boundary and corners happen, and F for fiber. So N has no special value. N here, no, it's just, it, it's a, I have N gluing parameters here. So that's, yeah. It's just some gluing parameters give me boundary and some don't, yeah. Um, random choice of words. Um, Right. I'm not even going to say why this is tame, but it's automatically strong because um, here's the Y1 bundle. So strong means I have a meaningful bundle um, of better quality fibers. And in this case, the fibers are simply given by, right, this is my local model. Um, and I take everything in the base, but in the fiber, I only take the fiber of quality one. So this is this, this one is that one. So, uh, all right. Good. So, example. Right. Toy example. Right. So, <laughs> this is a an m polyfold. So, what you see here is an open ball 
that I've attached sort of two-dimensional Saturn ring to. Again, with open boundary here, and then I've attached just one interval. So there's sort of one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional pieces of my X. And in order to, for a you know, transverse section to cut out something smooth here, right? So what I would like to be able is to say, okay, I have a Fredholm index one section over this, you know, that goes into this two-dimensional domain smoothly and then maybe even into the three-dimensional domain. to cut out something smooth, right? So the goal is to not get a sub-polyfold, but it's actual manifold. Um, so if that is to be the case, I'd better have fibers of different dimensions. Right? And the fibers better jump sort of at the same rate as the base dimension jumps. And that's sort of nice to explain with the splicing, I find. Right? So here in this case, y over x, right? If I want one dimension here, I should have sort of no vector space over that. Everything is zero. Over these points, sort of y, x should have one. And over these points, I should have a two-dimensional fiber. And so really, at some point, the condition is going to be really that in this bundle splicing, somehow the fibers jump at the same rate. So, but we're going to build that into our definition of Fredholm operator. So. That's not in here yet, no. Right now, right, these could be these L2 things that this jumps at 0 and that jumps at 1. Right? That would not be good news. Um, Homework, right? Imagine how Nate's example gave you a little bit of transition map or a little bit of a chart for a piece here, right? And then you might have to, might want to put, you know, another chart that's just two-dimensional and then you'd have sort of an overlap, but it just goes from this two-dimensional piece to that two-dimensional piece. So, yeah, you, know, you then need somehow our definition of scale smoothness to say in what sense that's scale smooth. Um, what I do right now, I do want that. Actually, I, I, yeah. I'm just so confused. So, like, um, when you say, so Fred home section is going to mean something that imposes uh, jumps at the same time. Right. Yeah, actually, maybe let me write this down and then, right? So, um, so here's a little chart that I would like to, so my chart map is going to be diffeomorphic to some open subset of this. ambient splicing, right? So now, right, I'd better have a topology in which this thing is open, right? But that's how we build that. Um, and what is this, right? So this here, this ambient splicing was the union over R, <laughs> so R is this direction here. And each fiber here was some line in L2. So the funny thing is just that these lines in L2 are not constant. They sort of turn into all the infinite dimensions um, because it's this family of bump functions that somehow weakly converges to 0 because it just gets pushed out to infinity right. as, you, as you get closer to that point here. So. Um, right, so here, so what I'm actually going to take here, right, is I'm going to take the projections to be the same 
projection on L2. To the same little bump function that's just zero for v less or equal to zero and it's a bump centered at something like e to the one over v when v is positive. Right. So right, so so far this is just here, this is just the image of the little pi because that's just my base, right? But now my fiber over this is going to be the same thing except it uses the same base gluing parameter again. So, you know, over this I'm going to have the same fibers and here, right, at every point here, the fiber is zero. Right, so that's the same thing I'm going to use. Oh, yeah, maybe I should say here, right? Over V, the fiber of my base splicing is zero, so the fiber of my bundle splicing is also going to be zero. And at a point here, this fiber is one dimensional, and so over that point here, my fiber is also going to be R beta v. So the local trivialization or the bundle y over u is simply going to be, well, again, this open subset, what is it? Uh, right, I could take the points v comma x or v e that lie in this thing here, open subset O, right? And over each of them, the fiber is again R beta V. So these are my fibers. Right. What about the one interesting point? Then? What about, right, so what happens at the interesting point, right? So the fiber of my splicing is still just zero, right? And so the fiber of my bundle is also just going to be zero. It's just that then, because the fiber of the base jumps, I'm going to have the fiber of the bundle, or of the, I'm going to have the fibers also jump. So that way, the ju dimension jumps at, you know, equally, and sort of my Fredholm index actually stays constant, which is a good thing. Right? <laughs> it's not built in here. No, it's going to be built into the definition of a I should, but one could say, okay, so let's actually do this here. So Y is fillable if um, for all V, I think the kernel of pi V is isomorphic to the kernel of capital pi V. So that's the complementary. Right. And we're going to have to fill at some point. Yeah. Can you explain what it means to be strong? <laughs> strong just means that this, this nice bundle Y1 is defined, which in this case is sort of automatically defined because we have these nice fibers. So we, I can just take the fibers of quality 1 in the, in the ambient Banner space. Is that a property so, of the bundle or extra data about it's a property of a general M polyfold bundle. It is automatic for M polyfold bundles of splicing type. Right? And what you want to think of is when you have this, right, where's my, right, the real example. Right, it is time for the example. The kernels of these two maps are both infinite dimensional. Indeed. And therefore, I mean, if you. What do I mean by this, right? Yes. Doesn't it have to depend something nicely on V? Yes. Isomorphisms and. And um, I mean, suppose you take a projection to yes. a two-dimensional space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that isomorphic to projection to a one-dimensional space? Yeah. In some sense, I'm going to need a. F Can you just trust me that this is going to be built into the definition of Fred home filling? Okay, okay. I was just Great. About that. Yes, please complain. I guess you, out of all, have the right to complain. <laughs> 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 yes. 
Um, anyway, so the way you should really think about this strong and Y1 is because you have fibers H3 over H3 maps. Um, so um, really what you should think about strong is that H3 in a pullback tangent bundle makes sense when U is in H3. But so far, usually our fiber over a point of quality H3 is usually just H2. Roughly speaking. Right? So there's sort of yeah, better quality. Well, it makes sense and it's sort of invariant under coordinate changes. Except if, right, so if I wanted to make sense of H4 over an H, in an H3 pullback tangent bundle, then that is probably going to depend on some choices of the trivialization, right? But in H3, it's, it's going to be independent, so that's, um, let's see. Uh, good. Okay. So this was the baby example, and this was already sort of halfway to the real example. <coughs> so uh, it's going to be very sloppy. Um, so I want to think about the bundle near a k-fold broken FLIR trajectory. Because I'm lazy and I don't want to say SFT. You could think, you know, K fold F, uh, a building, right? This, a K fold broken floor trajectory is the same thing as a K plus one floor building, because if you want to break K times, you need K plus one trajectories. And the first place where I'm going to be totally sloppy is that, of course, floor trajectories I have to mod out by R at least, and I'm not going to do that. So. Um, Sorry, the, yeah. Does the gluing parameters also correspond to the height of, height of the building? The gluing parameters, right, yes. So for every floor, then when I glue together, I need one gluing parameter. Exactly. Yes. Yes, so K is N there. N is, yeah. <laughs> well, no, actually. Ha, no, it's the right K. <laughs> because these come from nodes, interior. Um, so every actual breaking, every floor breaking, that's what gives me the boundary. And um, also in yes, yeah. And then internal nodes are just going to give me right internal. I mean, I could have wrote, written C here, actually. Right. Let me not do that. Right. So um, good. So what is my bundle splicing here? Right. So, so I'm going to have k gluing parameters. I need some base space and some fiber space. And I'm just going to tell you what the projections are. But first, I should tell you what these scale spaces are. right? So what do I need to parameterize flirt trajectories? Right? I need to vary these. So really. For every trajectory there, I need to have a, some section of a pullback tangent bundle. Right? And then once I've varied them and I apply the Fleur operator, the perturbed Cauchy Riemann operator to it, um, I should end up in the fiber. So these fibers then are just going to be the same kind of product except H2 in the fiber because I'm thinking about an operator of order 1. Right. Um, and then right, uh, I'm going to be lazy for now and just write epsilon E f goes to pi epsilon of E 
Play epsilon of f, and now I need to tell you what the projections actually are. Um, right. So, really, and each of these is a tuple, right? This k tuple, and these are k plus one tuples. So, pi epsilon is the um, projection in the sort of uh, retract that Joel um, defined at length. So it should be the projection to the kernel of an anti-gluing along the kernel of the plus gluing. <laughs> right, so whenever I see variations of the FLIR trajectories, right, really I'm thinking, okay, I vary and then I glue it together. Right? That's sort of my chart map. Um, but that has ambiguity. So what I want to do is I want to sort of reduce the ambiguity. That's why I go to the kernel of the anti-gluing. But by reducing the ambiguity, I should like, somehow not change what the point actually is in X that I have in mind. That's why I go along the kernel of the gluing. So I don't actually want to change the point that I have in mind. Um, right, and now you're going to say, okay, there's evidently gluing parameters missing. And I think it's just worthwhile to say this again. So, um, so what are these? So these are anti or pre-gluing of the, right, of really the sections I'm going to, I think, probably, well, there's a lot of fuzziness here, right? So you have to ask yourself, can I actually glue these? Um, and then I should do this with some gluing parameters. And those I like to be somehow large. Um, so there's always going to be some gluing profile in the picture that takes small parameters to large parameters. And the choice of this gluing pro profile is sort of, that is, that is one of the foundational choices in this whole subject. There's pretty much just, well, there's one for which you get smoothness. And that's unfortunately not the sort of obvious one you choose from D Dylan Mumford space. So um, eventually somebody needs to prove that the invariants that we get out of this are independent of the choice of gluing profile. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, yes. I think you can presumably Ooh. always go in one direction to larger groups. You can go to right. So, there are so well, somebody has to study what you take, yeah. and then for any two, I think you can take a larger. Yeah. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that it's independent. Something should work. But then there's a question whether there's a, an actually a total order on gluing profiles. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, but, but, but it's basically like if, if somebody gives you R, the, the real line, and you don't know what it is, and then you have to choose a chart. So you take the identity, or you take x goes to x yeah. cubed. So the difficulty is only oh. at one point, basically, which is sort of power. Hopefully, yeah. So in particular, this is where you're saying that, uh, like if you look at grown up with moduli spaces for uh, the integrable j, the smooth structure that you z will right. give you is different than that. Possibly, yes. Yeah, so we we don't know that yet. Stuff right. is attached, it's, <laughs> yeah. You know, I think there is a smooth structure, but in in, in of it, it clearly doesn't matter because you can avoid all this stuff. I mean, you can you can well, the integration <laughs> can be turned into intersection problem, and for the intersection problem, you have uh, count zero dimensional stuff, and it avoids the nodal stuff, and the gluing profile only appears there. So, so that should be independent. In the, in the, right. Right, let's, let's keep that for next week. <laughs> so, um, right, so um, let's see uh, what happens. Right, so strictly speaking, I told you how to glue in the base, but you can do exactly the same thing in the fiber. Right. You, so for the fiber, 
and this again goes back to sort of Vivek's question of what do I actually have a section off, right? Um, I don't have a section that just lives over sort of the broken FLIR trajectories. I want to also sort of encode my section that lives over the unbroken FLIR trajectories, right? And that takes a, a glued FLIR trajectory and applies the FLIR operator to it, so you get just one section of one, of, you know, something that lives over a glued um, curve. And so in the fiber, I kind of need to have the same domains that I have, or the sort of glued domains, right? I glue the cylinders, so I need the same domain in the fiber that I have in the base. So that's why somehow the delin mumford parameter, maybe you could also think of the epsilons here on the splicing, right? The parameters are sort of the delin mumford parameters, and they affect the maps and the sort of zero one forms in the same way. So. I'm getting yes. confused about this thing. Like your section is like debarred or something. Right. So why is that not defined on the whole space of FLIR? I could define it on the whole space, except there's nothing to do with FLIR theory. But the full E is are just parameters. So I should, um, right, I should maybe write this down, right. So, let's see. What do I have here? So my FLIR idea, right, so what is my D-bar operator? really in terms of this uh, pre-gluing and things. Really what it, it sort of takes a big pre-glued curve to D bar off that pre-glued curve, right? On most of it, right? It's just one d bar. It's not broken, right? So the open or the, the main stratum of x is the unbroken one, so this is the main stratum of my operator, right? Except when I'm near a broken one, this sort of I want to pull all of this back somehow to um, something here that should be in the fiber and something here that should be in the base. Right, so somehow this comes from a choice of gluing parameters and all these FLIR trajectories, right? So that I glue together to parameterize this point, then I apply the debar operator, and then I need to go back. And so I kind of take the, what, what, what am I doing here, right? I'm going to the fiber, so to get to the fiber, I need to take plus and minus inverse off exactly this thing and I force minus gluing to be zero. Right. So this then sits in that fiber. Ah. Yes. Right. So that way I can, this way I'm pulling back the debar operator that just acts on a, on a single cylinder, I pull it back to this sort of tuple of cylinders here by sort of first gluing, um, applying debarring and sort of undoing the gluing. So, right. However, as you can see, right, if this is a Fredholm operator, right, I'm losing a lot of dimension here, right, so I have a massive kernel, then this is Fredholm. And then I go back and I have a massive, um, well, this is never going to be surjective. There's a lot of things I don't map to. So I have infinite kernel here and infinite co-kernel here. And so the idea is going to be to cancel the kernel here by the co-kernel there. So, right. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to get there. So, but this is, so this is my real life example. And again, right, so here, Y1 now comes from the local things that are V, E, and then, oh, 
the f's that are actually already in H3 and not just in H2. So that's really what I should be thinking of as that bundle Y1. So, yes, right. Yeah, I feared that would come, right? So, um, yes, and one could say that. Um, but I haven't said what filling is, so ask me that again once I've said filling. Um, let me just quickly say what, what can I say now? Right, so let me go down my laundry list actually, right? I needed to tell you what an auxiliary norm is. So um, what this is, is a continuous function on this better quality bundle. That's a complete norm in each fiber. So classically continuous norm in each fiber. And in the example, well, you take the norm at a point, what is this? V, E, F to be F, H3. Oh boy, and now I'm there's probably an exponential weight on here. Because if I want this to be a scale space, right, if this is F0, then this is supposed to be F1, and so that needs to be um, compact in F0. There was an ex there's an extra condition yeah, so on the norms. Yeah, so there's, because the others can get some degenerate class of that. So you want, if, uh, if you have a sequence of vectors where the base converges to x, and the lim soup uh, is going to zero, okay. then, then the vector converges to the zero. <laughs> okay, good. There's okay. Some, there's some yes, there's something. So okay, good. good. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um, small print. There's also, right, so I should say, right, so obviously you can see all the small print in the Hofer Wisotsky Zinder papers. Um, and if you're trying to find where that specific small print is, I would recommend looking at the what we used to call the user's guide, polyfolds at a glance or two, that um, <laughs> we also posted at, on the, on the web page. That, that is lacking this small print, however, it always precisely cites the place in the publications where you can see all the Wait, now details. it's called polyfolds at first and second. At first and second glance, right, <laughs> yes. Because it became too long, right. Um, so, um, I need to tell you what an SC plus section is. So a section, well, first of all, a section is something that gives you the identity when projected down. Um, and it's SC plus if it actually takes values in these better quality fibers and is SC infinity as a section of that better quality bundle, which is exactly you know, a first order. So what you should think of here is a zeroth order operator. Well, compact operator. Maybe compactly supported would be really nice. But, um, the node here is that the classical perturbations, if I change j, this is something like j minus j prime dt, that is evidently first order, so this is not sc plus. So wiggling j is not what happens in this regularization theorem. However, a homotopy of J's fits into this cobordism um, argument, and so um, that makes sort of changes of J built into the theory after all. Can you just say, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Why is that not as close of what property does it Well, it's first order. Okay. So in particular, this needs to take H3 to H3. Okay. And it, right, okay. yes. So right, yes. Um, Good. Okay, so now I can, 
Right, so now the, I think the only thing left to say is what is Fredholm? Or am I missing anything else? Right, but we know what compact means. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and I explained what controlling compactness means. So, um, so um, first things first. So now this is, the, this is the place where I think a grad student holed up in a basement would have a little bit of trouble making up the whole theory. Um, so Fredholm is not quite obvious. So one thing I need is I need it to be regularizing, which means that if I'm in the quality, if my section takes values in the quality k fiber, then I actually want to have the base also quality k. Which is like saying if d bar u is in hk, then u is in hk plus 1. Also known as elliptic regularity. So that's something that's sort of true for the operators that we usually look at. Um, and then the key point is this filling that we've alluded to. Um, and this, at last count, you needed a filling somehow strangely, not just at solutions, but at everything that's sort of smooth, that's of quality infinity. Um, so near each point, I need a local trivialization and a filling. Um, and I'm going to say what a filling is um, so that the filled section is Fredholm. Ha ha. <laughs> so this Fredholm, however, is going to be easier to define than that Fredholm. <laughs> because this Fredholm happens on splicings and retracts. And this Fredholm is going to be a map um, between Germ, yeah. Or map, germ of maps, right, between Banner spaces or SC Banner spaces or SC Hilbert spaces in this case. So I'm going to leave that for the moment undefined and tell you what the filled section is. So, oy, oy, oy. so in a local chart, Right, I'm going to this bundle splicing. This sits in, and now I'm going to forget that there are open sets. I don't want to write another one in here. So that sits in a splicing that sits in here. And this bundle splicing sits in the bundle splicing that sits in here. And Right, so what I would really like to do is I would like to fill up my section here so that I have any chance of this being Fredholm. So let's see, what could I do? Right, so first of all, my problem is that this E is not, this VE is not necessarily in O, but I can map it down with my retraction and then apply S, which sits in here. So that's not so bad. Um, Ooh, let me, I should say what this S actually does. So right now you're defining the filling? Yes. <coughs> so I want to, right, so the section takes VE obviously to VE and then something happens in the fiber. So I'm just going to write F for whatever S does in the fiber. And so then I can apply F. F is only defined on O. So I need to throw in a projection here. So I can do that. But then I'm only ever going to hit the, f the, the splicing within this fiber. I'm never going to hit the complement. So I want to add something. 
and I'm going to let whatever happened there just depend on the complement of E. So I can write each E as pi V E plus 1 minus pi V E. That's the splitting here. And I'm going to use the same splitting in F. This is the splicing and the complementary <laughs> splicing I'm going to have right this guy here. And what do I want? Right, so, so f prime of v comma dot, right, maps the kernel of little pi v to the kernel of capital pi v. Um, and I'd like this in an appropriate sense to be an SC infinity family <coughs> of isomorphisms. Right. The idea being that I do need to soup up kernel and co-kernel to make S twiddle Fredholm, but I don't actually want to change the zero set. So that's the main remark. Um, S twiddle inverse of zero is S inverse of zero. Um, and also the kernel and the image of the linearizations of DS twiddle are isomorphic to the, that's, that is wrong. Kernel and co-kernel image perp are isomorphic to the co-kernel kernel and co-kernel of DS. So that allows me to dream of Fredholm theory. So that is the theory. So this is yeah. the linear? Yes. Isomorphism. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But to make it necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could also talk about more general stuff, except it shouldn't change. So the solution set and the present shouldn't change. Yeah, there's, right. yeah. But I but mean, in, the cases you're in my splice, I mean, this is a simple, I mean, I think. So, well, here, so here's the example, right? Um, so in the example. Actually, listen, one example yes. is as good as all. Yeah. Only have to know one example. Right. So the filler is the linearized operator. Um, where you may ask, right? It's um, it's on the anti gluing. So um, so overall, the filled section. So if you look up there, I wrote down what actually the section is um, in local coordinates. So the section went from epsilon e to, what was that? I just wrote down the fiber plus minus inverse of plus of e and 0. Right, so that was my, that was the section. And in order to get the filled section, all that I'm doing is I'm writing down the minus gluing here. Oh, right, complete breakdown. Of course, there was a debar operator here. And so the minus gluing of E um, always lives in So if H3 of R times S1, it comes from data that is very close to the breaking. So um, it just lives over a fixed Hamiltonian orbit. Well, it's really a product, right, because they have various breakings. So P 
point being, so there's no R dependence here. And so when I take the linearized D bar operator on this, um, there's a general theory that says that um, R invariant operators here, if, you know, if they are useful, if they're Fredholm at all, then they're actually <coughs> isomorphisms. So um, this is of the form ds plus a. And then you read my favorite paper by Robin Salomon. Which paper? So, about, I think, spectral flow. All right. All right. And <laughs> I have uh, successfully sidestepped the question of <laughs> what a Fredholm map between scale Hilbert spaces is. <laughs> so, um, which is evidently in my notes. Um, so I'm just going to hand wave for like one minute, and then you can ask me about details if you want them. Um, so the problem is really when you're proving the implicit function theorem that you need to do Newton iteration. And the Newton iteration sort of comes from a contraction. And when you write down the contraction that you get from a scale smooth family of, of from a scale smooth, um, what, what, what do you actually mean by a Fredholm section, right? That's nonlinear. Usually we say, well, the linearization's better be Fredholm, right? So, um, <laughs> that's something that makes sense. But the other thing we need is that New Newton iteration works. And that requires a certain continuity of the linearizations. And unfortunately, there's this scale shift. And so you get a contraction property, but the contraction goes sort of down in levels by one. So if you start iterating, you go further and further down in levels. That does not bode well for any convergence. So you kind of need to sort of force yourself back up. Um, so we need to add something called a contraction germ property. That sort of implements this um, contraction. Um, so really what this is is a contraction, a level preserving contraction in all but finitely many dimensions. And so then you ask yourself, well, how do you ever prove this? Well, and that sort of ha comes if your Fredholm section is actually, right, it's scale smooth, so that means you always have that loss of levels. But if you have classically C1 in all but finitely many dimensions, then you can prove that that implies this contraction property, well, plus some small print. Um, and so that's, this can be found in the gromov witten paper, and somehow I independently figured, well, that there should be a better definition of Fred Holmness. And um, I'm currently revising that paper in which I also attempt to prove the Fredholm property for flirt trajectories. And um, I would end by saying that polyfolds are awesome because you actually get referee reports. So if the referees are in the audience, thank you. you know, uh, they did not complain of me failing to spread peace and harmony. They actually wrote the, read the paper and you know, found mistakes and pointed out things. And so. I'm revising, and that is, yes, beautiful thing. So uh, I wish all referee reports were like this, and maybe I just need to keep doing polyfolds. <laughs> uh, 
On the polyfold mini course page, there's not an obvious lecture notes link for this lecture, so we're supposed to go to sections. Six yeah, well, I'm 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 going to scan these. Okay, so you will scan them yes, and, put them on. and then put them on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, however, I would say I mean all of this is sort of essentially just skimmed from the user's guide. Okay, so, so we go to sections. Yes. 6 .2 yeah. And 6 .3 yeah. If you want to, there's there's more than everything in there. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm trying to create a set of some case and I want the auxiliary, I want to find that. Can I just use the norm you already have on the first level of the elements in your box? I thought so. Well, I, right, he's asking me and I'm asking you because I don't know what the small print is. So I thought you yeah, just so you use so cutoff functions. Take local and you take local coordinates and take sort of the, one, the norm on the one level and take a partition of unity and put this together that way. That works, right. It, it satisfies whatever small print you have. Awesome. Good. Any questions? So this is the condition of the bonus. How do you define the whole index? Ah, uh, as, the, as the index of the linearized thread home operator. Yeah, and then somewhere it's, it's built in that that's actually constant. Yes. And then you could ask, how do you define orientations, right? So you need to construct the determinant line bundle and yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're reconvening at 3.35. Let's thank her again. Thank you.